Rewatch Podcast presents The Wilder and Pryor Rewatch. I still can't believe it. In addition to discussing the four films featuring comedy greats Jim Wilder and Richard Pryor, we will be discussing two extra standalone films. Come and get it, cowboy. Richard Pryor in Brewster's Millions. I'm going to be a little crazy for a while, but I'm not crazy. People are going to think I'm crazy. You stick with me. You're my buddy. And Gene Wilder in The Woman in Red. You tell my superiors at the office who can give me raises and promotions that if they don't like my answer, they can go take it and shove it up their ass. Send your feedback to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. Like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash rewatchpodcast, and follow us on Twitter at rewatchpod. Double the workman's salary. I mean, I mean, they look exhausted. Today we're discussing Brewster's Millions, starring Richard Pryor, John Candy, Lynette McKee, Stephen Collins, Jerry Orbach, Pat Hingle, and Tovar Feldshu, directed by Walter Hill. Welcome back to the Rewatch Podcast. I'm Corey. Now, everyone, go back to work, because this is a business, and we're in the business of being in business, <laughs> and we're doing business and nobody's business. Do it. Business. Good. I want business done. That's the way it should be. Let's do business. <laughs> That's the longest opening <laughs> ever done. And I'm Nathan, and here's my proposition. You have 30 days in which to spend 30 million bucks. If you can do it, you get 300 million. It's a tempting offer. And that's what we're here to talk about. Bruce's Millions, Richard Pryor. This is the first of our bonus episodes after our Pryor Wilder rewatch, you know, finished last week with Another You. Yes. So this was your favourite Richard Pryor film. You chose this one. When we were kind of discussing, you know, Wilder and Pryor and doing all that kind of... The idea came up of maybe just doing one of each Pryors and Wilders as as bonus episodes. So Bruce's Millions is first, Woman in Red is second, which is going to be next week. But before we go too far, Oh, should we just watch the trailer, Corey? Let's do it. Money. Everyone wants it. Until now, Monty Booster didn't have it. They tell me you're my only living relative. But he just made money the old-fashioned way. You have 30 days in which to spend 30 million bucks. He inherited it. If you can do it, you get 300 million. But if you fail, don't get Deadly. Why can't I tell my friends? Because I don't want anybody helping me out. Ah! What's wrong? Mike, what's wrong? Thirty million dollars. Man, he's got thirty million dollars. This is a good day, you know. He can't keep it unless he can spend it and have nothing left but the shirt on his back. Oh, we're gonna have a, a lot of fun with this kind of money. <laughs> Jay, I'd like to hire you as my official photographer. Salary ten thousand dollars a week. How would you like to be my personal driver for the next thirty days at five thousand dollars a week? What a country, America, I love it. Hey. Everybody, anybody want to go to lunch? Everyone thinks he's crazy. I want to bet $50,000. And when up, we'll sell it. I think we should consider the possibility of psychiatric help. At the rate you're going, you'll have spent your entire inheritance in less than a month, and you'll have nothing to show for it. But $300 million says he's right on the money. Richard Pryor and John Candy. It's like that old saying, you know, if I was for money, I'd be a millionaire. I'm a millionaire. Brewster's Millions, coming soon from Universal Pictures. All right, welcome back. Trivia for this film. Do you want to kick it off? Sure. Brewster's Millions came out on May 22nd of 1985 on a budget of $20 million. It raked in just under $46 million. Yeah, it actually did pretty well. It did just under $10 million in its opening weekend. A little uh, film called A View to a Kill was the opening that weekend too. Ah. And Rambo First Blood Part 2 was opening there as well. So Rambo opened to $25 million on that weekend. Weekend and View to a Kill did $13 million. So it's actually pretty interesting to think that Rambo actually beat a Bond film, for God's sake. That's actually quite interesting, yeah? <laughs> Well, A View to a Kill, uh, yeah, it's, it's the 80s era of Bond, and let's just say they got a bit cheesy and maybe yeah. drove some people away from the franchise. But still, it's Bond. 
but yeah, I mean Rambo. I mean that's your eighties action film right there. Muscle oh, Mouse totally. Stallone, kicking ass, taking names. That's what people wanted in the eighties. Beverly Hills Cop, Police Academy Two was all still in the box office at two on the second weekend. Bruce's Millions came out. It did five and a half million, and an, another little film called Fletch opened up the following weekend. That opened in number two position behind Rambo, which took in another fourteen million dollars on the second weekend. So ever since I've kind of started digging in to these box office figures i'm just astounded with the kind of the classics that mm-hmm. were regularly opening up week after week like really great films and movies that we're still watching today don't you reckon well yeah i mean you listed off some actions there but those comedies i mean classic comedies and brewster's million is is no no exception i mean those are some solid classic 80s comedies you know brewster's millions included in that so yeah what a time to be at the movies a crazy crazy time and this is obviously directed by walter hill who is actually known as a bit of an action kind of director he did the warriors another classic action I know, I know. And he also did, he did quite a few, but he was behind the Eddie Murphy hit 48 Hours as well. He was also a producer, and you you may have heard us talk about him a little bit in our Alien Predator series rewatch we did, because he was the producer on the original Alien, actually all the Alien films, might I add. I think he retained a credit, like even on Alien vs. Predator, he retained a credit on. But as far as directing stuff that he does now, I mean, he hasn't really been doing too much. He's okay. He shows up doing a little bit of TV here and there. He did an episode of Deadwood. I think he did the pilot, actually, if I remember rightly. He has made a feature in 2012 called Bullet to the Head. But yeah, like directing features these days are kind of few and far between. That Bullet to the Head was actually film starring Sylvester Stallone and Christian Slater and Jason Momoa, might I say. Man, never even saw it. I'm going to have to track that down. That sounds great. Well, you know, well, Walter Hill kind of knows what he's doing so I bet you at the very least it's fun and this is very different for, for him I mean he usually does you know some gritty films some more action oriented films even 48 hours even though it's Eddie Murphy is a real actiony kind of film so I mean this is a huge departure for him doing a straight-up comedy Brewster's Millions which I might add this version of Brewster's Millions is the seventh adaptation of the film. <laughs> it's uh, actually based on a book by George Barb McCutcheon, which was written in 1902 and was called Brewster's Millions. But yeah, I mean, the seventh version of it, people may not actually realize that. Well, there was, an, there was a version as early as 1914 that got made and the premise of the previous novel was to spend a million dollars in 30 days, not 30 million. So they changed the premise slightly for the 1985 reimagination. So yeah, pretty interesting. And they were all called Brewster's Millions by two of them. There was the one made in 1961, which was called Three on a Spree. And in 1926 was called Miss Brewster's Millions. So obviously they swapped up the character to be a woman in that film. It would actually be reasonably interesting to kind of track down one or two of those versions to see how they kind of adapt it because as much as I know this film is a, like a flat out kind of comedy with Richard Pryor in you know full steam ahead kind of mode. There is kind of you know a serious kind of movie being made here. It's not just like an all out comedy, I don't think. Don't you reckon? Exactly. Well, you can catch them all except for one. the uh, The original film adaptation from 1914 is considered lost. No surviving copies. But yeah, they, they made more versions in 21, 1926. Mm. 1935, 1945, 1961, and then, of course, this one here in 1985. You also mentioned, too, that this is like a bit of a strange film for War Hill. He actually came out and actually mentioned that this movie is actually an aberration in the in his career line, being his only flat-out comedy that he actually made. He added that whatever the film's deficiencies, I think the wistful quality was there. I was happy about that. And the picture did well and made money. So it turns out he was happy. And this film actually does this really strange thing that I don't really recall seeing all that often in a movie before where about two or three times throughout the film the film kind of stops at about a third of the way through and this rolling kind of credit comes up the screen like a snippet from a newspaper or something i don't really recall seeing that device used all that often in cinema i mean i could be wrong it might have been used like 50 or 100 times but it felt pretty fresh to me actually i thought i thought it was quite original Mm, and i think that's a walter hill touch to tell you the truth if people ever saw the warriors not the original 
cut of it, but later Walter Hill went back and did a recut to do something to it that he couldn't do back in the 70s when it was made. And that was to insert all these comic book panels for it to sort of freeze frame, shift to a comic book, and then it would move panels to get you to the next scene. And that's wow. like kind of his style is to kind of just stop and do stuff like that. So yeah, it's kind of, it gives it this like signature in a way of Walter Hill. Oh, interesting. Apparently, um, Jennifer Beals was actually up for the uh, original role of Angela Drake before L Lynette McKee was cast. Alfred Woodard was actually also considered for the role. I think the the woman that does the job is perfectly fine. I've, I've never really seen her in much after this. Yeah. But the job she does is fine. Yeah. I think so. And uh, I love this here. There's uh, a part of the movie where we kind of scan over like Miss Drake's accounting of all the money, and there's a few things on the list here that it shows you what what Brewster was doing to sort of rid himself of this $30 million and some of the expenses that he incurred. And some of these are really great. Like he's got, you know, he's got the ones that we know of, like the security guard expenses that came to $1.16 million. <laughs> Beer and wine, $2.1 million. <laughs> 400 pounds of New York dirt for a pitcher's mound, $7,000. Oh, my God. <laughs> These are crazy. Nightclub rental, 610,000. <laughs> I don't recall a Rupert Horn commemorative statue. <laughs> 210K. I don't recall hearing about that, you know? <sighs> man it's just too good i mean this movie's just filled with stuff in the background i mean if you really go through it you can find all this kind of stuff he spends three thousand dollars on exercise videotapes <laughs> <laughs> 27 lifetime health spa memberships <laughs> oh my Lord. presumably to give to uh the guys in the baseball team but oh it's very funny thirty one thousand four hundred dollars worth of dental care for baseball team <laughs> like there was just so many great little touches in this film that just sort of let you see how he was getting rid of all this money apparently there's a, a couple of times in the movie as well a, a train actually passes through the outfield of the stadium where the hack and sack balls are actually playing and apparently that was actually something that was reasonably common in the 30s and 40s of ballparks used by teams in the texas leagues where they just have to halt play and you know wait for the train to pass yeah, I didn't I didn't know that. I would imagine it's a touch of just somebody who's like, you know, if we're going to have this baseball team and they're kind of like a lower end baseball team, it's you know probably like a drawback to their childhood or something like that. Something I just want to mention before we wrap it up is Hill has actually come out and said that um, Richard Pryor didn't actually believe that he was funny unless he took drugs. And they actually believed that if he took drugs he would actually die. Also, apparently he also had money problems, of course. So he had to actually work and take jobs and make lots of money. So it was actually really difficult. But apparently Walter Hill liked Richard very, very much. I find Richard Pryor, he's just an enigma. I can't really work him out as like an actor because he's so likable in this. And I, I think he's very funny. And you don't really get the idea that he's just totally off his chops throughout. Like he doesn't come across that way. I, I don't think he does anyway. No, no, not at all. And it's interesting because, you know, we kind of touched on his um, issues with drugs when we were talking about Stir Crazy. Crazy. And Stir Crazy was made before this film. So apparently on Stir Crazy, you know, we had the director and some of the security saying that Pry was just always mainlining coke and stuff like that. You get here to 84 and here he is where he's like, I should take drugs to be funny, but if I take drugs, I think I might die. Like he's really... Like, it seems like he had some sort of paranoia going on in his personal life. But, yeah, I mean, it's fascinating, really. It's... Yeah, it, you know, it, it would be pretty interesting to read a biography about Richard Pryor and trying to get to the bottom of where his head was kind of at because he's a pretty interesting guy and I think he had a few adventures. Let's just say that, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> and the last thing, I guess, before we move off the trivia here, I don't know if this is well-known or, or anything out there, but apparently Princess Anne <laughs> visited know. the film set of this during, like, a US tour she was doing. Very random people you know people out there if you don't know who princess anne is she is daughter of queen elizabeth ii and sister to prince charles i think by now she's probably like 20th down the line to <laughs> get the throne but yeah i mean weird right when i was doing the trivia for this other day and i read that i just thought that's that's just really really strange all right well shall we get into talking about this movie brewster's millions? yeah let's do it so brewster's millions pretty much we get straight into it getting us introduced to the main character Monty Brewster, like by Richard Pryor. And he is in like a minor league baseball team as a pitcher 
for the Hackensack Bulls, which I think Hackensack, that's New Jersey, right? Yes. Well, I think they say Hackensack Bulls because very early in the film, like Monty Brewster is kind of pitching for the Bulls and he's convinced there's a guy like in the crowd who keeps taking photographs of him and he's goes, I'm sure that's a scout. And John Candy's character, Spike, comes up to him and says, says, no one ever comes to, this is Hackensack, New Jersey. No one ever comes here. You know what I mean? Like, just get that out of your head and stay focused kind of thing. And that's our really early introduction. You can kind of get the impression Monty Brewster is like a bit of a local kind of celebrity. I mean, it actually gets revealed later on in the film that he's actually been pitching for 15 years Mm. and has kind of made like a career out of it, but he's never really made a lot of money, has he? His best mate, Spike, he's the catcher. And I mean, it's John Candy. You know this is going to be good. But what did you think of this team up between Pryor and and John Candy. I mean, this is the only time they ever appeared in a film together. Yeah, I'm not too sure why they didn't kind of reconnect and maybe do a few more because I thought their energy together was clearly great and and really, really good. I thought maybe towards the, the, the latter half of the film they didn't really utilise the comedy stylings all that well of both of them, but certainly for the first half of the film it's, it's very, very evident and I, th- I think the chemistry that they present is great. Like, what did you think? Oh, I absolutely agree. I mean, here at the beginning when they're playing the baseball game and they're talking about this possible scout and stuff and candy's there he's insulting the batter and all that stuff i you know i think they're working really well together afterwards they're in a bar and they're trying to chat up these two women and they've got this great back and forth of like you know you can tell they've been buds for a long time because they kind of give each other like slight looks and nods and stuff and the guys the other guy knows where he's going with all this pickup line stuff. I think you can kind of tell too, these two guys, I mean, you, you wouldn't describe them as losers per se, but you can tell they don't have much in their lives. Like their lives are baseball, drinking, hanging out, picking up girls, baseball, drinking, hanging out, picking up, like you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of totally where they're kind of at and they don't really want the party to end, do they? No, and you know, of course, immediately they get into this bar fight because I guess the boyfriends of these women show up and of course (laughs) John Candy comes in with an insult so they get in this bar fight and end up in jail one of those guys that shows up at the bar he's in he's in one of our previous rewatches he was he was a very familiar face I've got to try and work out where he's from he just looked very familiar to me but that's okay I won't waste time kind of (laughs) focusing on but yeah but Pretty much it's just to land the two of them in jail. And even they kind of get a sense this happens quite often. They get bar fights and they end up, you know, spending the night in jail. They've got to post bail. After they get in jail, Jerry Orbach shows up, who might I add, is great in this. <laughs> He's pretty good. I mean, it's not much of a stretch for him. It's Jerry Orbach playing Jerry Orbach. I thought he was really solid. I totally believed him as, like, the manager of the Hackensack Bulls or the coach, whatever you call it. I thought he was really, really good. So, anyway, he shows up. To the, to the jail and basically says, look, Monty, we're done. You're on your own. The management has no interest in bailing you out this time. They're going to get college guys in. They're going with youth. They end up being pulled out because the guy they thought was the scout needs to take him to a meeting in New York. And Brewster is convinced that it's the Yankees calling. Doesn't he keep saying the Mets or the Yankees? The Mets, the Yankees, the Cubs, maybe. I don't know. But that, he is positive. So Spike is tagging along and they get taken to New York. To the point where they show up at the uh, at the lawyer's place and the receptionist says, you know, who, who are you here to see? And he, and he, like his first thing that he says is, my arm's okay. It's two years old now. It's okay. And John Candy's in the background too. Like he's looking over the index of businesses. And he's just like, I knew it. No cubs here. What, the, what are we doing here? You're a cop, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the guy's just insistent. He's just like, look, they just paid me to take some pictures and bring you here. That's all I know. So Monty gets pulled into an office. There's a few lawyers there. And they lay it out. His great uncle Rupert Horn has passed away and left a massive fortune to Brewster because he is the only surviving living heir. They do explain it, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Something to do with Hume Cronin's a character going to like, you know, disavowing his family like like fifty or sixty years ago and just prior he he says his great grandmother was white and you know i married her and something like you know what i mean like there's like this reasonably convoluted way of getting to to richard Pryor, but they do get there exactly trying to explain how hume cronin is related to richard Pryor. 
<laughs> and yeah, he does just have a throwaway thing about how somebody's granddaddy married a black woman or something at one point. And yeah, the lines sort of diverge there. But long story short, he left the family a long time ago, made a fortune, but now everybody in the family is dead except for Brewster. He is the last surviving heir, and he is the only one he wants to give him the money to. But there is a big catch here. <laughs> Brewster, greetings from the grave. Don't look so surprised. Didn't you know your great-grandfather was a honky? The old man married twice. One wife, white, produced me. One wife, black, produced your grandmother checkered family, you might say. I've outlived them all, except you. They tell me you're my only living relative, Brewster, and I gotta say I'm very disappointed. Look at you. What have you made of yourself? A failed baseball player. I believe in being honest, Brewster. No bullshit. <laughs> I'm stuck with you. But we're gonna have some fun. <laughs> let me let me tell you a little story brewster when i was seven years old my daddy caught me smoking a cigar locked me in the broom closet for three days and three nights with nothing but a box of cigars and a book of matches no food brewster no water, just those goddamn cigars. Wouldn't let me out until I finished every last one of them. Taught me one hell of a lesson. I'm going to do to you what my daddy did to me. I'm going to teach you to hate spending money. I'm going to make you so sick of spending money that the mere sight of it will make you want to throw up. So, here's my proposition. You have 30 days in which to spend 30 million bucks. If you can do it, you get 300 million. There's gotta be a catch. Of course there's a catch. You have to spend the 30 million, but after 30 days, you're not allowed to own any assets. No houses, no cars, no jewelry, nothing but the shirt on your back. <laughs> so it sounds easy, don't it? Well, you'll find out. <laughs> now, you can hire anybody you want, but you gotta get value for their services. You can donate 5% to charity and you can gamble another 5% away, but you can't give this money away, and that includes buying the Hope Diamond for some bimbo as a birthday present. <laughs> oh, I, I know what you're thinking, Brewster. You'll buy yourself a dozen Picassos and use them for firewood, right? Wrong. You must not destroy what is inherently valuable. That's instant disqualification. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. You're not allowed to tell anybody why you have to spend this money. Why can't I tell my friends? Because I don't want anybody to help me out. Nobody helped me out in that closet with those cigars. I never had any friends. Well, Brewster, what do you think? You got the balls for it? I doubt it. That's why I put a special wimp clause in my will. You can have a million dollars right now and forget the whole thing. Or you can go for the big one, Brewster. The 300 million. But if you fail, you don't get diddly. He keeps laughing, and I think it's actually really interesting because the way that is shot as well, because um, Rupert Horn is like obviously filmed something, and he's got like a nurse standing behind him, <laughs> and the, the nurse is really like staring straight at the camera. I think it's hilarious. It's set up in such a way like he'll sort of say, you know, I've left you thirty million dollars, and and then he'll leave gaps in the audio for for, for Richard Pryor to talk, and then he'll kind of answer in the film like, like as if he's like if, as if he was like anticipating the yeah. question that Richard Pryor was going to answer. And I thought it was just really well kind of put together yeah for, for a message in a video i think it's excellent performance by hume cronin you know the way he coughs and splutters throughout it as well because he tells the story of the cigars as well so you're like <laughs> it's almost as if like it's caught up with him all these years later this like lung disease or something it is it's a very good performance from him the other catch is that he can't tell anybody about this yeah yeah what he's up to so you know this is the big setup 
He's got to spend this $30 million somehow without accumulating assets and he can't tell anybody what he's doing. So if he fails to spend the entire $30 million, he forfeits whatever balance that is left and inherits absolutely nothing, leaving the balance to the law firm. So that's why you've got these two overarching old lawyers conniving to try and, you know, get Brewster to kind of fail at every turn. He, well, he is offered... A wimp clause. A wimp clause, he calls it, yeah, yeah. where he can just take a million dollars, now that's it, gone. And he thinks about it, like, very briefly, but he packs up that $1 million, pushes it back and says, nope, I'm going to go for the 300 I think you'd have to, wouldn't you? I mean, $1 million, that's a lot of money, but $300 million, that's just crazy. <laughs> well, you know, it also makes me think, like, they wouldn't do this because it, it wouldn't make much of a movie. But even if you had $30 million, like, you could spend a month trying to figure out how to funnel off a large portion of that $30 million to somewhere else. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you, you can kind of work it out, but but I suppose the movie's trying to not like assuming that either. Like it's just exactly yeah. He's going to take the thirty million. He's going to try his best to spend it all. Like that's and the premise we're going. Also, too, that the law firm has kind of issued him with like a a paralegal from the law firm, which is this woman named Angela Drake, who they just keep referring to as Drake earlier on in the film, and he I doesn't know, the pronoun that. game, right? You know, yeah. they're just like Drake, Drake. He's like, I'm not going to tell Drake anything. Of course, she walks in. This that typical put glasses on her she's nerdy but yeah she comes in and he's suddenly he's like oh miss drake oh and he starts swooning over her. basically after this all happens brewster essentially goes crazy spending money offering exorbitant amounts to borderline anyone um, who kind of comes <laughs> near him and if he sees like an opportunity to give someone a large amount of money for not much value in service but getting yeah. some kind of value out of them he will absolutely do it so brewster he i mean you got to also to remember that he has no concept of money because he's never ever earned more than eleven thousand dollars a year so he rents an expensive hotel suite at the plaza hotel and essentially kind of bullies his way into the plaza hotel too so saying i want to kind of rent out the the top two floors or whatever it is and the concierge says no sir like there's actually somebody up there and he actually says well what, what are they paying you and he says you know twenty five thousand dollars or something like that and then the next doesn't month. he offer him like a hundred grand or a million dollars or something like that and he immediately gives it to him like straight away you know and from the get-go i think he comes up with some good ideas of how to get rid of this money without accumulating anything because like you said he hires people at exorbitant amounts of money he rents everything as well so you know another good way to get rid of a whole bunch of money and you know i think those, these are all good ideas but still it's 30 million dollars like how do you get rid of all this money this is ridiculous it makes for funny scenes though you know especially you know he, he finds out that the money's real they go to the bank he just hires all the guards throughout the whole bank for like what is it like four grand or something <laughs> he asks him how much he makes and he's like 355 <laughs> and he just says well you can't live on that how about four grand and like you walk into a room and sort of say all the workers look tired give them more money yeah <laughs> exactly you know he stops a cab and says like i'll give you you know all this money to be my personal chauffeur go and rent more cars and everything for everybody i'm taking everybody to lunch he's like the hit of the town too like my opening line i was actually tempted to say i'm chuck fleming action news <laughs> <laughs> that guy keeps popping up quite a lot of this film because there's a lot of news reports and the whole city's going bananas like they're just going crazy over this brewster guy who just keeps splashing around money and brewster is endlessly trying to come up with like inventive ways to kind of get rid of the cash he meets angela drake's partner now Warren, he's actually a lawyer at the law firm that you know wants him to lose. For some reason, he hires him to like be an interior designer. <laughs> it is really great because Angela's like you know my fiance is like he's he's very big on lots of charities and you can't buy him. You know, there's no amount of money that will make him abandon his values. He's a honest feminist. He's an, um... <laughs> yeah. yeah, he immediately invites this guy over. And he says, oh, we're late for a, a benefit on, uh, what is it, banning contact sports or something. Brewster just gives him $100,000 and says, oh, I hope this helps. And the guy immediately, immediately 
starts to like back out on his morals because he's offered a glass of champagne and he says, oh, you know, I don't drink alcohol. As soon as Brewster gives him that hundred thousand, he's just like, oh, well, you know, I, I think a sip of champagne is kind Maybe of warranted. And, yeah, exactly. You know, so from the get go, you know, this guy is going to start becoming a little bit more lax on his morals. And it's all, of course, a big ploy for him to sort of get closer to Miss Drake. <laughs> I know. So he ends up hiring Warren and his ex-wife or ex-fiance Marilyn yeah. to do this like overhaul of their room and they keep coming up with like they're all these like crazy kind of and it's very 80s too. Like it's futuristic kind of designs and whatnot. Like Mesopotamia. Or... <laughs> Mesopotamia. <laughs> and there's a scene later on where Brewster walks in and he analyzes the room and Marilyn is like desperate to kind of uh, Brewster to say this is the best thing he's ever seen. And he sort of says, hey, look, I like it i like where you're going but i'm just not feeling it i want to know that if i can walk into a room i can die in it it becomes marilyn's kind of obsession for the remainder of the film to to kind of you know work out what the room that brewster can kind of die in it's a lot of fun and hey i i, I meant to ask you did you notice rick moranis I did. I was actually just about to go there. I was going because yeah. it's like you said with Chuck Fleming. I mean, he serves as like a, a way of sort of letting you know where Brewster's at with his money, right? And he comes out of a car, and Chuck Fleming's there, and he says, "What are you doing?" And Brewster just says, "We're starting business. We're in business, and we're hiring." You know, he doesn't specify what the business is for, and he just says, "We're hiring." So a bunch of people just start showing up at the Plaza Hotel, selling ice bags and stuff. But friggin' Rick Moranis shows up for all of like a two and a half minute walk on as this guy who, what, imitates people? <laughs> He's like, yeah. anything you say, I guarantee will be repeated. So for like two and a half minutes, he just says everything that Richard Pryor says. <laughs> He plays the character Morty King. That's it. Morty, Morty King. Morty King. That's it. Yeah. This is after Ghostbusters came out. So, and this is such a small part. Like, I was really surprised to see Rick Moranis in this film because Ghostbusters was such a hit and he was a really good part of that film. I'm surprised he kind of took this role, but maybe he took this role before Ghostbusters came out. Probably would have been shot in like 84 and released in 85. So, I mean, probably one of those kind of things, you know? Yeah, I would think so. You know, he's, he's a comedian that's out on the circuit and people recognized him. He got a bit part in here, but yeah, his big breakout was in Ghostbusters probably. But it's a great bit. It's good. For a quick cameo, it's pretty funny. So you've got these, all these parties going on. You've got all these like pictures kind of going on to Brewster. And you got to remember too, like everyone around him thinks he's kind of crazy because they just don't understand any of the decisions he's making. They're all backwards decisions. As soon as he is making money in the stock market, he says to sell the stocks and everyone's like, no, you don't sell, you buy or you do something like that or whatever, whatever it might be. He's making stupid bets on like long shot races and field hockey games. <laughs> and what? They're just like, he has gone crazy. Spike is the one who's like mostly outspoken about it of course Angela just hates him because she thinks he's just being stupid with all his money and that he's just going to spend 30 million dollars in a month and have nothing to show for it so she just hates him for that but yeah Spike is the one who's just like you need to settle down and you need to invest your money properly Pryor keeps kind of telling Spike you don't understand I can't tell you you don't understand trust me Things are going to change. Like he says stuff like that a lot. You can tell it's like this weight on his shoulders. And like Pry doesn't like being this guy, does he? He really doesn't want to yeah. be perceived as an asshole because he's not an asshole. He's a nice guy. He's the local celebrity baseball pitcher for the Hackensack Bulls, you know? Like he's been doing it for 15 years. And now he's like a major New York celebrity. Like every time he walks out of the hotel room, there's crowds and there's cameras and he's on the news every night. And he is perceived as like an eccentric. And I think Pryor's acting ability does tell us that, like, that, he, that he's uncomfortable with that a bit. I think he... he... He walks that fine line, you know. He he does say at the beginning when he says he's going to go for the three hundred million, and the lawyer guy say to him, "Do you feel like you're up to this?" And he says, "I don't know, but I'm going to have a whole lot of fun doing it." He walks that line of like, "I am having so much fun <laughs> doing all this crazy stuff." But yeah, you're right. There's a weight on his shoulders of not being able to tell people what he's up to and not trying 
and not being able to explain that what he's doing is completely rational when they all think he's gone crazy. I mean, it's really good, you know, and it's especially with his baseball career as well. He's decided he's going to at first he says, I'm going to go ahead and buy the team, the Hackensack Bulls, <laughs> yeah. and then immediately retracts that and says, oh, actually, I, I'm going to rent the team for a little while and i'm gonna buy you all new uniforms and i'm gonna do up your stadium and do all that kind of stuff yeah and you're gonna come out to new york and we're gonna have this game against the yankees and it'll be great exposure for everybody in the team because he truly believes that everybody he plays ball with is genuinely good they just haven't had their chance to to shine yeah exactly to show the world how good they are so he's gonna set up this game with the Yankees and of course he's just spending all this money ridiculous amounts on yeah you know renting a stadium doing the whole thing up they get in this whole thing about how the whole team was going to get onto a bus and come to New York and he says no you don't need a bus so he rents all these helicopters and everything brings them over to New York and then they say oh now we're going to get in the bus because the stadium's over at Long Island and he said the <laughs> airport right. was at Long Island so you flew us all the way over here just so we can get in a bus and go back there and he goes oh well I have the band here and they wouldn't let me take it out on the tarmac so you had to come over here first and just stupid amounts of money all this money and anything he can do to just you keep can tell spending that Jerry Orbach is getting like frustrated like with him and as much as he kind of appreciates his help he also sees that it's all flash and it doesn't really amount to much you know I think he's kind of a little bit uncomfortable with kind of what he's doing to the hack and sack bulls but you know it is what it is hey just quickly sorry to backtrack a little bit but the scene earlier on where we meet Warren did you notice Richard Pryor breaks the fourth wall I did notice that actually I'd never noticed it before but watching it this time yeah he turns to the camera and says now that guy's an asshole <laughs> yeah something like that <laughs> Sorry, I just I had to mention it because I know you, uh, you you did a show about breaking the fourth wall on one of your other podcasts. So. I do love when uh, when a character just does a little thing like that, like Ferris Bueller's. It's one of my favorite yeah. movies of all time. So. Sorry to change topics, but you know it is good, you know. And these are all like legitimate good ways to get rid of all this money. I'm finding it hilarious at this point. I think we've kind of moved ahead a little bit too because prior to us getting to the Yankees game, we actually have a scene. They hire this particular guy and John Candy brings him in and says, look, I've got some really good news for you, Monty. We've hired this guy. He's a money-making machine. He's guaranteed to make you money. Like he's got an 86% chance of, of making you money. And, and then the guy butts in and goes, well, actually, it's actually 864 percent to be precise and yes i will make you money and i will only take a 15 percent cut so if you if you don't make money i don't make money and he keeps trying to pay him <laughs> he's like <laughs> he's, he's, he's like i'll give you a hundred thousand dollars you know a week or something like that spike is like no he doesn't want the money and he goes well in this case i'll make an exception i will take the money because it's such a <laughs> such a kind of thing yeah. but but he kind of comes back you know a little bit later in the film where he shows up with spike to monty and says look i've got some really really good news for you we've made a few kind of investments for you and we've actually made 10 million dollars at that point that was all the money he had spent so far <laughs> and he freaks out totally a grade freaks out and he's like why did you do that and he's just like oh my lord i've just i'm back to where i started how can i do this now you know and meanwhile everyone around us thinks he's totally nuts <laughs> How's it going, buddy? Okay, <laughs> tell him the good news, Eugene. Oh, you tell him it was your idea. All right, I got some good news and some bad news for you. Well, tell him the bad news first. All right, all right, all right. Here's the bad news. I did exactly what you wanted me to do. I got rid of all your iceberg stocks. That's great. That's the bad news. <laughs> you ready for the good news? Yeah. Okay, here it comes. I took Eugene's advice, all right? Admittedly, without you knowing, I used the corporate name. I hope you don't mind. No. I made no. a couple investments for okay. you. That's, and that's okay. What did I buy? I bought a commodity thing. I bought uh, an oil well thing. He just and I got... made you ten million dollars. Ten million dollars! <laughs> Make the guy $10 million and he acts like it's a funeral. It's American money, you know. 
the guy he gave all the money to to go and place all the long shot bets comes in as well with a whole sack of money <laughs> he also tells him that he can't place a bet in the town anymore either because no bookie wants his money so there's no more gambling your money away monty i think don't they try and give that money to like charity like instantly or something like that because it was got illegally and he said you can't kind of log that back in it's illegal bet you can't do that or something like that well he's just he didn't want it <laughs> i just i got all this money back now just give that to charity get rid of it whilst all this is happening and you know he's making money and spending money people think he's crazy you've still got the lawyers behind the scenes conniving and they actually get into warren's ear they kind of see because warren actually goes to the two lawyers and says look i need a month of leave because i've been given this extraordinary opportunity to kind of redecorate monty brewster's apartment they actually see it as an opportunity to go look we'll give you a leave of absence but we need you to be our eyes and ears and to kind of report back to any kind of you know misdoings and there's a bit of a crucial scene where monty Brewster, I keep I keep thinking Monty Burns when I say Monty. <laughs> Corey, Monty Brewster gives twenty thousand dollars to Warren for a deposit on some kind of furniture of some description, doesn't he? That plays a bit of a key role towards later in the film, wouldn't you say? Exactly, it's their way of ensuring that Brewster is going to lose this whole thing, and that is for Warren to take the twenty thousand as a deposit, put it down, then get it back. Give the receipt to Miss Drake so it looks like that money has been returned. But he's going to hold on to that 20000 until the 11th hour. But he walks in, if he walks in and says, look, I've spent all the money, then Warren can come out and go, oh, look, here's that 20000 I forgot to give back to you. You didn't spend it after all. And then the law firm will get all the money. Monty actually comes up with a very ingenious way to kind of get rid of his cash. He decides to run for office and everybody thinks he's bananas. They all kind of say, you know, running for office is crazy, especially with your own money. People never make money unless they win. And he creates this party called None of the Above, which is he basically sees that the local mayoral election is being run by like these two buffoons who have absolute no kind of moral value. They don't have many ideas or platforms to go forth with. They're just kind of not very nice people. And Brewster decides to take them to task about this by creating this none of the above idea. And um, he keeps kind of telling people, I don't want you to vote for me. I don't like, I don't want your vote. Like, I never thought anyone would vote for me. I just, I'm just kind of highlighting how ridiculous this whole system is, you know, and especially with our kind of modern times that we live in Corey like it kind of resonated a little bit with me the whole kind of mayoral election and none of the above and all that kind of stuff like it, it was quite profound I found yeah I agree I think it's that thing of like when he comes out and he's bagging out the other two people who are running for office and yeah he's actively telling people not to vote for anybody I mean it's the slogan none of the above don't vote for anybody don't, just don't vote these people in don't vote for me, even. <laughs> yeah, wasn't there like a big ginormous billboard that says, please don't vote for me, I'll only make things worse? Yeah. <laughs> and it goes like so far that the other two candidates like team up to try and like get rid of Monty out of the whole thing or something. So it's a, it's a pretty ingenious idea just to sink all this money into a campaign. He takes out time on the major networks like every night for like an hour <laughs> and he basically has like his own show where he just <laughs> yeah. rambles. And in every state too, it's not just New York. He did it in every state just in case there were New Yorkers who were out of town. So he spent even more money to go national with his campaign. It's really good. And he keeps taunting those lawyer guys too, which I think is <laughs> Calling great. Calling them dickheads and yeah. stuff. Yeah. He buys like a rare, like the rarest of rare stamps <laughs> and they think it's hilarious. Like, oh, that's a pretty considerable asset. Next thing you know, he sent them a postcard saying like, wish you were here. Yeah. <laughs> and he sent it to them, mailed it with this like extreme rest <laughs> which is now not his property because he mailed it out and yeah they are just furious with this guy they then start taking him a bit seriously don't they they go well geez like he's he's burning through that cash and like we haven't even mentioned um pat hingle who's in this film who's like the executor of the estate he's the good lawyer there's three lawyers and two of them are conniving against him but Pat Hingle is the one who wants him to succeed. 
and he's pretty good in this film too. Like, I quite like him as as a character. I think he's he's clearly on Burns's uh, oh God, Burns Brewster's side. Actually, it's funny because he says he's on Brewster's side, and you know, I said the same thing. Like, he's the one who wants Brewster to win. Really, he just introduces himself as an unobjective third party, where he just says, "I'm just here to oversee it." If you win, you win. If you don't, then I'm going to shuttle everything off into the law firm. Like, this is just his job. <laughs> and he's true. He's just such a nice guy that you just like, of course he wants Bruce to win. But he does kind of give him some, like, encouragement. Basically saying, I think that was a very smart move. Stuff, stuff like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's not actively working against Bruce to not no. to win. Like the other two. But he's not pulling purse strings behind the scenes either to try to force him to win either. Like, you're right. Like, if he legitimately doesn't win by the letter of the law, then then he will give all that money to the law firm, money. So while all this is going on, they get to the game with the Yankees. And, you know, he gives, like, a good rousing speech to all the guys. Like, why do you think I brought you here? This is your chance to shine. This is nationally broadcast. This is a, an absolute exhibition game and i think they said like all the proceeds and stuff would go to charity whatever but he said we're doing this and they have these commentators going as well and they're kind of like the yankees are winning of course i mean <laughs> they're a major league baseball team against the hack and sack bulls and it's like everybody's like booing the yankees and they're just like who would have thought people would be booing the yankees we're in new york it's not embarrassing though like like you're no. right the, Yan the yankees win but it's not like a totally getting smashed and i think it's pretty funny too all those scenes with like john candy talking shtick with the yankees and talking about like their wives and you know yeah she's an ugly son of a bitch uh, yeah, and, she's ugly yeah. a bitch <laughs> yeah, that's it that's exactly <laughs> it's pretty funny but it is it's like it's done without the malice you know it's just like we're playing a game of baseball here and there's a reason why we're doing this and it and the reason is, is that he just wanted exposure for his teammates because he loves the sport. And yeah, the Yankees win, but, you know, that's, I think that's kind of the moral of it is that, you know, money just can't buy things just because he's got a lot of money and he can afford to have his small town baseball team play the Yankees doesn't mean they're going to win. Money can't buy that. They just have to play them and see how it goes. And they don't win. And he, <laughs> he does win the campaign, though, because <laughs> during the game, the election polls come back. Brewster's won the election, and of course the lawyers are like, you know, this job comes with like a 300 and something thousand dollar a year paycheck, which is considered an asset. So what does he do? He just gets up and goes, I told you not to vote for me, so I'm stepping out now. I think it's very sincere at the end, you know, the way that all this stuff comes together, and that moral of money isn't going to buy everything. It's quite a poetic moment for Monty Brewster because you've got that moment where Jerry Orbach comes out and actually relieves him halfway through the game or three quarters away and she said, look, I've got to take you out, man. Like, it's, it is it is what it is, man. You've you've had a good run, 15 years. People would kill for that. Like, I'm proud of you, you know, and saying stuff like that and, and then kind of making Monty realise that, okay, his career's over now. Like, it's done. Like, it's no more baseball for me. Like, what do I do now kind of thing, you know? So there's a lot riding on the line for Monty in this situation. Like, his baseball career is over. He's got this wonderful chance to kind of inherit this money from Rupert Horn. And if he can kind of jump through the appropriate hoops and do all this by the letter, letter, letter of the law, then he'll get $300 million and set up him and his friends and family for the rest of their lives. But if he doesn't, then he just goes back to being, you know, Monty Brewster, you know, just a guy just kind of getting through the day. I think he doesn't really want to do that he kind of wants more for himself so yeah like we've got this situation where the yankees win the game and he comes out at the end and he gives the speech and he kind of resigns from the none of the above but he makes it clear and says look guys I've still got money, man. I've got like 30 grand. I'm going to throw a party tonight. That's, that's what's going to happen. So you're all invited. Come down and let party with me. And this is his last $30,000. So you get this scene where they get to the party. You get like uh, the security guard, John Candy, and the photographer. And they're, like, they're all kind of like passing like a hat around from Monty. Like <laughs> this will help This will help him through the day kind of thing. This will help him kind of get, get back on his feet and stuff like that. I like that scene too with the photographer who's clearly cheap john candy's like man like you like you're just like a, a dickhead aren't you like you know like he's always kind of like bickering with that guy and he's got this really bad blue suit on too that just looks terrible yeah and he like doesn't he take his wallet out and says man thanks for the donation just throws it at the hat you know <laughs> 
And then when he tries to give the money to Monty, who clearly refuses the money, the photographer takes the, his wallet back out and says, you won't be needing this then, will you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and this is pretty much the last time we're going to see John Candy in this movie. It's just him saying, like, look, we've passed around the hat. We've got a bit of money together. We know you're, you're broke now. Like, we just want to help you out. He even says, like, you've paid me, like, hundreds of thousands of dollars to work as the ceo of your company like we could take some of that money and and, you know i've put it all aside and we can do something with it you know he's a true friend to the end you know the money didn't ruin their friendship at all even though he acted like a complete nutball the whole time doesn't he say that he's going to like hire a car and we're going to go on a drive through like across america after Mm. this and do all that kind of stuff and live the american dream and stuff like that but you're right like i think it's pretty clear that these guys are pretty genuine friends spike is a bit sad to see kind of where brewster's ended up but once again brewster reiterates things will be different tomorrow trust me you know what I mean? And he keeps exactly. kind of alluding that something's going to change. So he leaves the party assuming that he spent his $30 million and he goes back to the lawyer's office. This is where he goes up to the to Pat Hingle and the two bad lawyers. And we also see Warren up there who he meets in the lift out of nowhere for some reason. And Warren says, hey, man, do you remember that $20,000 you gave to me? Well, here it is, man. You, you're not broke after all. And he freaks out, doesn't he? Well, yeah. He, <laughs> Warren makes the classic bad guy mistake of accidentally... Re- well, I guess sort of... It's almost like he brags, in a way, to Angela about what the plan was, you know, before it can be done. Because I think Brewster was ready to give up the $300 million anyway. Because he walked in thinking, like, oh, this is done. Warren has as yet not revealed the 20000 And I think Brewster was just ready to get rid of it. Like, he, he'd learned his lesson that his uncle had wanted him to learn, to just hate money. I mean, he still knows who his true friends are. Spike was there and, you know, the security guard guy. And Angela, she kind of, you know, she was a bit annoyed that he'd spent all his money. She was the one who had to do the accounting for it. So she knows it's all gone too. But even she was, you know, she didn't go up to him and go, you're, you're a fucking idiot or something like that. She didn't throw it in his face. So when Warren gets talking with her... <laughs> before the stroke of midnight which was the time they agreed on reveals the plan to her she knows that he has just given up his morals just to get a job as like a partner of the law firm or something like that doesn't warren keep alluding to the fact that brewster and drake have had some kind of affair Mm. doesn't he call her like a rabbit at one stage or something like that and he's not very nice that guy exactly so before it can strike midnight Angela comes in, throws all this out there, and then Brewster's like, I can't believe you, Warren, punches him in the face. (laughs) Yeah, I know. And he says, I'm going to sue you, to which uh, Brewster's like, I'm going to need a lawyer. (laughs) Miss Drake, can you be my lawyer? Uh, She says, well, I'm not actually a lawyer. I've got to go to law school for that. And he goes, well, I got this $20,000. that will get you through law school, right? And can be our retainer. She rushes out a receipt, <laughs> and hands it to Pat seconds. Hingles. Yeah, it's just as the last ring of the midnight uh, rings, and Brewster has won the three hundred million. And the other guys are going to go to jail for attempting to uh, defraud somebody. <laughs> Does he say you're going to take a long shower? <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> Oh, that's great, dude. Yeah. Actually, this is really weird. Like, you have the climax of the film where he gets his $300 million, and the film literally finishes, like, within five seconds of him winning the $300 million. Like, he turns away, walks away from the boardroom, and roll credits. Like, there's no, like, celebration with him and John Candy or in New York City or a report from Chuck Fleming or anything like that. It stopped really abruptly. This being the 80s, I mean, you think that they would have, like, uh, you know, that thing of where they would play a scene during the credits, you know? Nowadays, you get Marvel movies and stuff, they'll do like a mid credit scene and an end credit scene or something like that. In the 80s, they used to just have a small square pop up to the left or right and just play you a scene while the credits were rolling. And usually, yeah, it would be something like Brewster partying with Spike and the photographer guy and everybody, and they're just celebrating the fact that he's got the 300 million, you know? Do something funny because he's Richard Breyer and John Candy. I was actually thinking, like, th- I kind of almost felt like there was more story to tell. It would have been quite an interesting if they made a sequel to this film with Richard Pryor reprising Monty Brewster and actually seeing what he did with the 300 
million dollars? What kind of man did he become? And what kind of life did he lead? Like, like maybe he did do none of the above, like properly. And like, because there's a scene where he's doing the whole none of the above, and Chuck Fleming actually says, "Imagine if he was serious." Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is him not being serious. Like, imagine if he was serious. Well, he probably could be now. Like, I don't know, man. I kind of feel like there could have been a sequel here, or maybe some kind of room for one at least. Because I thought Pryor's rendition of Brewster was pretty spot on and very likable and I kind of wanted to spend more time with him yeah yeah absolutely I mean it's Richard Pryor and I can understand him not doing a sequel I don't really think Richard Pryor did any sequels to any of his movies now think about it he did do Superman 3 oh well yeah that's Superman 3 though. <laughs> <laughs> and that was his only appearance in a Superman movie what I'm saying like he didn't make a movie that was a big success and then immediately get in to do a sequel for it too I don't think it was the the kind of thing that he was into as an actor and comedian so I mean I would have loved to have seen it you know just him being crazy this time with 300 million dollars and yeah exactly what what could he accomplish if he was actually serious about it because he manages to he wins that full 10 million back at one point everything he'd spent just from being crazy and flippant with all the money it would have been an interesting thing you know i'm a bit surprised too in today's hollywood world that we live in that they haven't done a remake of this yet because this film is ripe for a kind of modern remake you could totally exactly this at this point this was the seventh version of the movie so i mean it can constantly be updated yeah so i can this is look out for it it wouldn't surprise me in the next three or four years if if this kind of pops up again and and you know if it does i look forward to it because the, the story is good enough isn't it exactly you get the right comedian you know they, they got richard Pryor for this one perfect fit so if they if they manage to find the right comedian to do this again they can come up with some fresh jokes and make it modern and i would definitely go and see it <laughs> anything miss drake this is a private meeting leave or you'll be fired sign right here son warren cheated and these two put him up to it he purposely withheld a twenty thousand dollar deposit so that money would think he'd already spent it i just forgot to give her the receipt that's all it was a perfectly honest mistake gentlemen is there any truth to this accusation totally preposterous we're completely innocent you are fired miss drake oh. my lucky day huh warren you're my pal right you're a liar, Warren! You tricked me! Set me up! Oh, no, no, not at all. That was just a coincidence. Hey, you're a terrible liar, Warren, and an awful decorator. Well, it's better than being a couple of rabbits. What are you insinuating? You're a big girl. You figure it out. Hold it, hold it, hold it, sister. Take it easy. You're a lady, and I want you to remain a lady. Oh, that's excellent advice, Mr. Brewster, but a little late, don't you think? Yeah! Oh. I'm glad you did that, Brewster, because... Because I'm going to sue you for so much money that you're going to be in debt to me for the rest of your life. How'd you like to settle out of court right now for $20,000 in cash? Oh, you think I came down with the last drop of rain? I'm not falling for that trick. Uh-uh. No settlements. I'm going to take you to court, Brewster. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> when that clock strikes 12, you are dead broke for life. You're a loser, Brewster. A real loser. I'm going to need an attorney, Mr. Drake. Will $20,000 be enough of a retainer? But I'm just a paralegal. I don't have a degree yet. You can get a degree with $20,000. It's just an advance. You need a receipt. Yeah. I'll give you a receipt. As the executor of your great uncle's will, I hereby declare that the full inheritance of $300 million is yours. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Gentlemen, I sense conspiracy to defraud here. I'm afraid that I'm going to have to order a full investigation of this <laughs> with your consent, Mr. Brewster. Well, I'll uh, send them to the showers. Take about 20 years to dry off where you're going. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear I'm going to give this a recommend. I love this film. I'm probably going to give it nine catches masks out of ten. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I would give this nine million dollars out of ten. Nice. <laughs> it's very solid. A very great performance from Richard Pryor, from everybody, really. Even Rick Moranis, like I said, the two-minute walk-on. 
was pretty damn funny. John Candy, I always love seeing John Candy, so very strong recommend for Brewster's Millions. It actually got a fairly mixed review when it was released. I didn't really kind of really talk about this in the trivia, but apparently the staff review in Variety said bluntly that it's hard to believe a comedy starring Richard Pryor and John Candy is no funnier than this. I don't know if this is, like, as I said though, like I'm, I'm not convinced this is a flat out balls to the wall comedy, like where it's just like a gag every five seconds. Like there's a story to kind of be told here. Like it's, it's, it's not all just gags endlessly. And it is a shame, though, that Pryor and Candy didn't team up again because I think there could have been some good material there for some subsequent adventures together. But I suppose we should be thankful we got one, didn't we? All right. So uh, next up, we're going to be talking about The Woman in Red, a movie that I've seen, but I don't really remember. But it's kind of, you know, it's around this same time period as when Wilder and Pryor were teaming up. So, you know, we kind of cherry pick that one out of all of like a bunch of excellent Jane Wilder performances but this was it kind of fit the area and the tone of the film can I recommend everybody gets the Stevie Wonder soundtrack out on on the cassette tapes and start listening to it for the next week <laughs> get them prepared <laughs> get them prepared do your homework right. yeah I do love that song all right well I look forward to that should be good absolutely all right so that's it for this episode of the rewatch podcast keep up with listen interaction by joining our facebook page at facebook.com forward slash rewatch podcast follow the show on twitter at rewatch pod and visit our web page rewatch podcast.podomatic.com and as always you can write us an email or record a voice message and send it to the rewatch podcast at gmail.com and if you've enjoyed the show, please consider giving us a rate and review on iTunes. It's the easiest way you can help out the show, and that really helps. And, of course, you can go above and beyond, help support the show by heading over to patreon.com slash rewatchpodcast, where you can make a monthly contribution at as little as a dollar. And, of course, our entire back catalogue is up on YouTube, so search rewatch podcast and subscribe today all right well thank you for joining me again nathan thank you mate yeah it's been great and that just leaves me to say until next time think of what this will mean to all those thirsty arab farmers none of the above the rewatch podcast is not associated with the copyright holders of these films and no copyright infringement is intended i learned my lesson and i will never do it again the use of any and all copyrighted material is only for parody, news analysis, critique, or educational purposes as provided in Title 17, a.k.a. fair use. Oh, is that all? I thought we did something wrong. Music provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. I'm not a wind-up toy. Copyright 2017, The Rewatch Podcast. I'm going to throw a party tonight back at the hotel in New York. And you're all invited! Hi, Rewatch Podcast listeners. I'm Corey. I'm Tom. And I'm Nathan. First off, let me say that we have all had a blast doing the Rewatch Podcast. Every week, we put out another episode for free for you. And although we enjoy these discussions with each other, we truly do this to you guys out there in podcast land. That's right, Corey. But we are here today to tell you about Patreon. Every week, there are costs involved in podcasting about film and television, including hosting and bandwidth charges, our own personal internet usage, and film or show rentals and purchases. So we're asking you to become a Patreon supporter. If you can afford as little as $1 to throw our way per month, it would really help us keep the lights on. And if you want to send $100 our way every month, we wouldn't turn that down either. But it's your choice, and we appreciate the support you bring. As always, we strive to bring you the best quality shows we can create, and we hope that you enjoy them. So head on over to patreon.com slash rewatchpodcast to become one of our patrons and show your support for the Rewatch Podcast. And if we get enough patrons, we may even be able to produce exclusive content just for the supporters in the form of simply getting episodes before the main feed release or even bonus film discussion episodes as a thank you for your support. The website again is patreon.com slash rewatch podcast. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>